So I just got back from both Burning Man and from Scottsdale, Arizona. Now, right after Burning Man, I ended up going to Scottsdale, uh, where I spent uh, you know a few days doing up to 10 hours of uh, video tutorials for Spear Education, which is a very high-end restorative dentistry group. So did a bunch of videos for them, and they're going to take a few months to get edited. When they do, uh, or when they are up online, I will basically announce that for you guys who may want to get a little bit more information that you get from our channel here on, uh, you know, on the weekly basis. And now off to our weblog. Hello, Rural Practitioners. This is Ali Nese, and welcome to this video log or vlog in response to the past couple of Friday questions that I had posted and generated a lot of questions and controversy. So I just wanted to uh, talk to you first about the two topics of coronal uh, uh, leakage as well as painless shots videos and also a little bit about Burning Man and try to uh, kind of explain some of the questions that have come up in the different uh, social media uh, in response to these questions. The first uh, question about coronal leakage was about the idea of if coronal leakage is so important and that we have to restore teeth right away, uh, should we then restore them immediately after endodontic therapy and what is the logic of waiting for uh, seeing if there is some healing going on? That's a really good question because uh, obviously uh, we have to find that right balance between waiting to see how things heal versus uh, waiting too long. And uh, granted, in situations in which there is a referral, for example, if an endodontist is seeing the patient, then um, there has to be a little bit of time, obviously, for the patient to transition back to the referring dentist. And that allows some, uh, also some monitoring to make sure everything is healing well. But if you're the general dentist and you're doing the root canal yourself and you're planning on restoring it, should you restore the tooth right away or should you really wait? That really has to do with your level of confidence about how well you've cleaned and achieved the objectives of endodontic therapy. Because everything we're trying to do, the whole meaning of efficiency in endodontics, is how well uh, are, you, are we achieving the objectives of achieving full length, finding all the canals, cleaning and disinfecting them with adequate irrigation and large enough apical diameter, and then obturating them adequately. And if you feel like you've achieved all you can, uh, then I don't see any reason really for waiting too much longer. You might as well restore or at least place the core, bond the core right away in that tooth. Which also brings up the other question of, well, if what about, should the endodontist then place the core or the post? Now, that is a geographic uh, issue, and it's, you know, in different parts of the uh, country, it works differently, at least in the U.S. and North America, where the endodontist place the core and the post, uh, or uh, they just place cotton and cavit. Here in the East Coast, we place the cotton and cavit for the most part. Um, but ideally, and a recent study has shown this, that the placement of the post and core at the time of the placement of a rubber dam where a rubber dam is present is really critical for the success of the root canal therapy in the long run. And that makes sense because if you think about it, uh, the post is actually no different than a root canal obturation material. And therefore, cementation of a post is really a portion of endodontic obturation, if you think about it. Uh, and what ends up happening is that when it, you, know, you place a rubber dam and do your obturation, and then the patient goes back to the referring dentist, and they place the, the post without a rubber dam, then there's a very high chance that there would be a smear of bacteria, either from saliva or even from the breath, if no rubber dam is placed, right before the post is placed. And that could cause contamination of your space and potentially uh, long-term failure. The recent study that was done a couple of years ago to compare the success rate of endodontically treated teeth where a post was placed either under a rubber dam or without found that the success rate of uh, root canal treated teeth with posts where the post was placed without a rubber dam in place uh, was dramatically lower. I mean, we're talking about 75% with the case of no rubber dam compared to like 94 5% in the case of a rubber dam being placed. So that brings up also the other question of if a tooth has been left open uh, to the saliva, at what point would you retreat the tooth? Now, it, it's it's a question that is comes up all the time because patients procrastinate the restoration of the tooth often. In those cases, my, my uh, preference is to to try to communicate with the patient what the risks are. Instead of having a cutoff line, obviously a cutoff line, if you open the tooth up and there is you know, bacteria and saliva and there is a clear contamination of the root canal, then you should recommend root canal ther therapy to be redone. Uh, but in the absence of any symptoms to percussion, palpation, and even some healing to take place on radiographically, evidence of healing, 
it's difficult to uh, have somebody going through a whole root canal therapy and all the associated costs and let them decide ultimately what they want to do. If they want to take a chance uh, with the understanding that it could potentially become a problem or have the tooth retreated prior to the um, restoration. So uh, that's basically all the major things I wanted to talk about on coronal leakage, just the fact that it's critically important in long-term success of all cases and that we should all pay more attention to the quality of our restorations. Taking a bite wing radiograph when you cement a crown is critical. Actually, when you trial cemented or pre-cemented prior to placement of the cement, to make sure that you have a good um, you know, flush uh, restoration with the tooth, good emergence profile, and a closed uh, margin is critical for the long-term success of your endodontic cases, not only just your crowns. Now let's go and talk about uh, the anesthesia uh, video. And the anesthesia video was uh, very well received. Obviously, a lot of people were uh, having a good time with watching the, the Burning Man component of it as well. I must say that that just kind of came up to me off the top of my head while I was there. So uh, I didn't mention everything that I should have during that video. And some uh, great clinicians, uh, like John Stropko and others, have uh, made some comments to kind of remind me to also mention some other additional helps in reducing the, uh, the pain of injections. And uh, of course, that goes without saying that uh, clearly the placement of topical is uh, is important. But the problem with the topical is that it has to be there long enough. I think at least you know having a dry field, putting it on there, and then waiting five minutes is critical. And that only helps with the needle insertion, not so much with the delivery of the anesthetic. For the delivery of anesthetic, two additional things that help are. Number one, we talked about the buffering, obviously, and then the heating of the local anesthetic is also very important. If you heat the local anesthetic and bring it up to the body temperature, that's been shown in several studies to also help reduce the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the discomfort of injection, uh, as well as the acidity. Um, so, and both of them together, if you actually can uh, have buffered anesthetic and heat them up as well, that's been shown to reduce, have a synergistic effect and really reduce the, uh, the, the incidence of discomfort during the injection. Of course, the gait theory of pain and pressure in the anesthetic area is also very uh, in the area that you are injecting at the time of insertion and even distraction methods during injection are all very important in reducing the pain. I personally believe that endodontic uh, therapy itself can be uh, completely 100% uh, painless if you apply proper anesthetic techniques. And proper anesthetic techniques are possible by understanding the uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of local anesthetics that you're using, as well as the innervation of the area. Now, I've, I taught the head and neck anatomy portion of the human body course uh, at the Harvard Medical School for four or five years. So I ended up, uh, we ended up doing hundreds of uh, human dissections and so on during this course. So I'm very familiar with the innervation in the area, but one of the recommendations I always have for the students who are interested in learning more about this topic is to, uh, to get themselves a, a dry skull, uh, hopefully not their neighbors, <laughs> but uh, get a dry skull and uh, go ahead and uh, use your anesthetic, a syringe and a needle, and go over all the landmarks on a dry skull because that's really critical. Because when you give an injection to, uh, to a patient, you really should be not looking at the soft tissues only, but really imagining, almost having x-ray vision to see that patient's uh, skull and bone anatomy in the area, especially in the area of infraavial nerve injections, so that you can give the most effective anesthetic by depositing the local anesthetic as close to the nerve trunk as possible. So uh, we're, I'm going to have some more uh, courses, in fact, on local anesthesia that I will share with you in the future. Also, a couple of questions that come up uh, about the, uh, the, the Burning Man. Uh, Burning Man, as I mentioned, is a, is a, uh, is a very interesting um, uh, festival of art music uh, and um, uh, of radical expression, if you will. There's a lot of philosophy behind it, too. People always say, what is it? And I always say that it's a layered experience. There's so many different things that people do over there. There is a philosophical basis to the whole project that is actually very profound and very interesting, a concept of, um, of sharing and a society in which everybody brings something to share versus one that is purely capitalistic based and it's all based on buying and selling. Also, some of the people have asked a few questions about uh, uh, my, uh, my background and my practice. I just wanted to share with you that's an attachment here in this video, which is a practice profile that was done on me uh, back a few months ago, actually, in the Endodontic Practice Journal. So with that, I'm just going to say goodbye, and I'm going to see you in the next video.